Well, hi again, everybody. My name is Greg Anderson, and this is the Good Timekeeping Show with Greg Anderson. So, you know, just recently I decided to show a little bit more love for mechanical clocks and watches. And so today is the day I want to make a kind of an in-depth review, as it were, for for this mechanical mantle clock that I picked up. This is great. A brand new clock, but uh, kind of a nice classic old design. This is the Hermley um, skeletonized clock. It's a model... 2304-000711. So um, I, I wanted to get a mechanical clock that showed off all the mechanisms. So that's why I got this, the open face design. And here on the sides in the back, you can see all the gears and uh, just basically everything except uh, the mainspring itself is encased in a barrel. But you can see everything else that makes this work. And that's kind of a fun thing to have. So um, yeah, let me, let me talk about that just a little bit. You see, these days it's just a matter of convenience and uh, well, cost also. Uh, there's a big advantage to just using quartz clocks. Just put a AA battery in your quartz clock and watch it run for months and months, maybe a few years before you really need to do any maintenance on it. Whereas a mechanical clock, you know, you have to wind it once a week and uh, you have to kind of set it up and, and regulate it to make sure that it's accurate. And so, you know, for most people, quartz clock is the way to go. These mechanical clocks, uh, they're just too much trouble and uh, people aren't really interested in maintaining a clock. They just want to know the time. But I wanted to see all of this. And so the, I wanted to just talk a little bit about how mechanical clocks work and what you have inside this barrel here is the main spring. Now, uh, when you think of a, a main spring, you know, <laughs> you might be thinking of something kind of like this, you know, springy like this. Well, not, not quite exactly like this. Uh, the, the, the main spring on this is more like a flat piece of metal that's been wound up into a coil. And then as that coil unwinds again, that is providing the power to run the clock. So, you know, let's just take this, for example, this, uh, this measuring tape, okay, just, it's soft, and if I wind it up, it's going to tend to, to keep that shape overall, okay? So, um, but with, with the, the main spring on this, it's more like the piece of metal that you'd find inside this tape measure. So let me just show you really quick. If I take a length of this tape measure, wind it out like this, and uh, you know, I have it in a, in a little bit of a coil there. If I let go of this, as you, as you can probably guess, it's going to tend to just go flat out straight again. So, okay. <laughs> but we want that action to be controlled better than, th than that, okay? That seemed really random and dangerous actually to do it that way. So what, what happens with this is it's coiled up and it's inside that metal barrel. So uh, you want it to unwind because that's where you get the power to run all these gears and the whole mechanism of the clock. But you want it to unwind in a very controlled way. You want the coil to stay inside that barrel so that it uh, doesn't make a mess and so that it's not dangerous, you know, so it's, it's easy to keep it going because it's all right there in the barrel. And of course, yeah, you want it to unwind at a very specific speed. So all of this mechanism here is designed to control the speed of that unwinding. And all these gears eventually lead to the two shafts in the front of the clock. Uh, the outer shaft has the hour hand attached to it, and that makes one rotation every 12 hours. And then the minute hand shaft is uh, the one inside that, and that makes one rotation every one hour. So as those two shafts that are built right uh, one on top of the other, um, as they rotate, that's where you see the, the hands move, and that's basically you know, what the clock is designed to do, rotate those two shafts so that the hands move and you can see the time. This one has one added bonus that I really like, and this, 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 this bell on top. So uh, there's a little shaft in here that has kind of a tear-shaped uh, piece attached to it. So most of the time, uh, it's, it's just the, the circular piece is coming in contact with the end of a little lever here. But once an hour, kind of the pointed end of that tear-shaped piece pushes the bottom of this lever outward and then uh, when it reaches a point where that little, that little point goes a little bit too far, 
then it releases the lever, the lever snaps back to its resting position, and so the bottom half goes back in that way, and the top half has a hammer inside it, and it's not inside this bell here, so when, when, that, uh, when that lever releases back to its resting position, just for a moment you get this. Ah, and it's very nice. And with this particular clock, you only get one bell each hour, no matter what the hour is. Now, with some fancier clocks and, you know, more complicated mechanisms, maybe you get one bell for the one o'clock, two bells for two o'clock, three bells for three o'clock, and so on, all the way to 12 bells for 12 o'clock. But in this case, much simpler than that, it's one bell. And so it's a nice, elegant clock. It's actually a very uh, kind of a muted bell. I mean, there's nothing there to kind of keep it muted, but it's just, it's not intrusive. When this bell rings once an hour, uh, I just I just let it run all night, uh, you know, in the living room, and we can't even hear it in the bedroom. It's not disruptive at all, even if you're watching TV or something. Just that, that one little simple bell. It's just kind of nice. Now, the bell also is a great way to help you regulate the clock. Now, when I say regulate, what do I mean? Well, um, one of the things, one of the key components in this clock that keeps the, the gears running at the right speed and makes sure that that, uh, that mainspring is unwinding at the right speed and therefore the shaft with the hour hand and the shaft with the minute hand, those are all moving at the right speed. Um, it's this pendulum here. This pendulum is helping that to happen. Now with a pendulum, uh, well, the, the pendulum works on some very basic physics and maybe I can give you a quick example here. So um, some clocks, rather than having uh, you know, a, a mainspring, they've got a chain like this that holds a weight. And uh, sometimes if it's one of the, like this cuckoo clock here, uh, the weight might be the shape of a pine cone or something like that. But I'm gonna use this chain to give you a quick demonstration of what a pendulum does. So if I have a long length of chain here and a weight on the end of it, and I just let it go here, okay, you can see that it swings back and forth. Okay, now if I shorten the length of this chain and use the same amount of weight here, and I do it again, uh, you can see that it swings faster. So the same principle is at work here with this pendulum. The pendulum is swinging back and forth, and uh, normally gravity would help it to just stop swinging, but uh, in this case, you've got some mechanism there that's taking energy from the mainspring, and that is keeping it swinging, but you want it to swing at a very specific speed so the clock is not running too fast or too slow. So if the clock is running too slow, you want it to run faster, and the way to make it run faster is you, in effect, shorten the length of the chain, or in this case, it's a pendulum, it's kind of a, a you know, solid piece of metal, but you want to move the weight up on the pendulum and that will cause the pendulum to go faster. If you need it to go slower, then you would lower the, the weight on the pendulum. So lower is slower, or you could say raise the weight on the pendulum and you raise the speed of the clock, lower that weight and you lower the speed of the clock. So what you have to do and what I had to do when this, uh, when this was brand new and I got it out of the box, uh, I had to wind it up put that pendulum on there and see what it would do. So I set it to, you know, the right time and I just waited. And I used the bell as my indication of exactly when it was reaching the top of the hour. And so uh, then I would wait an hour and see if it was running fast or slow. And at first it was running slow by about 20 seconds per hour. So I did the math and figured, well, that's about eight minutes every day. Now, according to this sheet of paper here, which this half is written in German and this half is in English, uh, so I wouldn't really call it an instruction manual, but it's the best I have. There's six, six, uh, six sections of the instructions here. So on the sixth one, it tells me that uh, when you twist, there's just a little nut uh, at the bottom of this pendulum holding the weight up. And if I twist it, uh, you know, righty tidy, lefty loosey, uh, or you know, as I'm as I'm looking from below, if it's clockwise, that's going to raise the pendulum and uh, you know, counterclockwise is gonna lower the pendulum. And one complete turn of that nut there will affect it by two minutes per day, approximately. So when I figured 20 seconds per hour, 
worked out to about eight minutes a day. So I went ahead and raised the pendulum by twisting that nut four complete times. And then I got much closer to what it should be. Now I still needed to kind of fiddle with it a little bit faster, a little bit slower. And one thing I found out is when this, when this bell rings, it's not exactly 60 minutes and zero seconds. Uh, even with the, when the clock is running and, and well-regulated and uh, keeping really great time, it may not be exactly 60 minutes and zero seconds between strikes on the bell. So, uh, once I got it to where it seemed to be within just a couple seconds per hour, then uh, the thing to do is just to let it run for several hours. Maybe, you know, get, get it to be just, just right on and then let it go for 24 hours and see how close it is after 24 hours. Now, there are many factors that you have to uh, keep in mind here. For this, it should be level. And uh, I don't know if you can see very well, I've, I've found just, you know, some little pieces of cardstock and whatever to prop up the back legs and to prop up one leg a little bit more than the other to keep it level. I can tell it's level by, um, by looking, first of all, at the weight. There's just a very narrow space in here for the weight to move. It's got to be in front of the base of this mechanism, but it has to be behind this ring that is the face of the clock. So if it's tilted just a little bit too much forward or a little bit too far back, then the weight is going to rub against one of those surfaces and then, you know, the, the clock will stop. And uh, besides that, it'll probably scratch up the weight. This weight is supposed to be kind of polished and look really nice. I've left, there's kind of a, just a little plastic film that they placed over it in shipping. And I've left that in place for now until I'm really comfortable and I really want to know where I'm going to put this. And then I'll peel that off and, and let it be shiny and pretty. But uh, so, so that's the one thing you want it to be, um, you know, level as far as the front and back, but you also want it to be level as far as left and right. So I propped up this one leg just a little bit. The table I'm using is not as level as uh, some of the other surfaces around the house where this was probably going to end up. So I'm just, you know, and, and one way you can tell that it's not level left and right is that TikTok sound might not sound even. So right now, maybe you can hear this. Okay, that's pretty good. It seems like a, a good rhythm between the tick and the talk, right? But if I take this thing out that was leveling it and maybe stick it on the other side and try and throw that out of level. Sometimes that affects the sound of the tick tock and it just seems like a little tick tock, tick tock, tick tock kind of a, a sound. But also if you look at it, you can see here that uh, the motion uh, compared to the the base of the you know the actual physical base of the clock here uh, is not perfectly uh, you know uh, balanced between how how far it goes from one side to the other. So just one of the things to uh, keep in mind as you're trying to make sure it's running correctly and you've got it in the right space. This also has a little notch on the back of it. So if you wanted to, you could hang this on the wall and uh, you know make sure it's level against the wall. But I kind of like using it on a tabletop here. There's also a wall version of this one. I'm not sure if it's a little bit larger, but the wall version, rather than having a mainspring, has a, has a weight and has a, a you know chain with a weight and has a longer pendulum. So I, I might get one of those eventually, but there is one, again, that's almost exactly the same, but uh, is, is the wall version. Okay, another thing I've noticed about this, since it is this open design and it's all metal, you know, a lot of times you'd have one of these inside a wood case, maybe something like this. That, t that tends to give it a more mellow sound as far as the TikTok goes. And in this case, since it's all metal and it's all open, um, it, the, the, metal, the metal affects the sound of the TikTok. It has more of a, a metallic sound, uh, basically, to the TikTok action. I don't mind that. It's not annoying. It's just different than, than you know, if you have some kind of mechanical movement inside you know, a wood case. Now, when I first got this, the pendulum was detached, and it's a pretty easy thing. There's just a little notch there where the, the pendulum hangs, uh, the bottom part hangs uh, on this more kind of escapement part here. And also, the, the bottom tip of this was kind of pushed outward, uh, uh, and it was on the front of the clock. So I, I think that might have had something to do with just keeping it safe during shipping so that it wasn't rattling around a lot. 
I don't know if normally they would uh, do it that way or put some sort of a you know padding in there, some sort of styrofoam or something. So uh, when I first got it out of the box, I had to very carefully push the bottom tip of this from the outside to the inside without bending anything too much, and, and I did okay there. Now, it will run without the rest of the pendulum. If you're careful enough, you can get it going. And that obviously is going to go too fast, so uh, it's not made to run that way normally, but it's just kind of fun to see it go that way. One way to, to you know, speed it up. Now, as you can see here with this open design, the hands are completely exposed. They're not behind glass, so you know, you got to be careful about where you place it because if something bumps up against those hands, you could bend the hands and you could kind of mess the thing up. Um, but what I found was that when it first came out of the box, uh, the hands were the hands were very well aligned, the minute hand especially. Uh, when it gets right up to the top of the hour there, that's when the ding happens. And so I, I didn't have to try to do anything to realign the minute hand to, with the rest of the mechanism. It was right on. The hour hand was just a little bit off, so I just gently tapped the hour hand until I got it to line up a little bit better with the hour position. Um, they do recommend that as you set the clock, you see, all you're going to do is you're just going to grab the, the minute hand and move it forward. They recommend you do not move it backward, but you just want to gently, uh, you know, push the tip of the minute hand, push it around clockwise until you get to, uh, again, the hour position and the minute position that seems to be the right thing. And then I, I like to double check that, uh, that position by waiting for the bell to ring. So one thing I can do is maybe like, you know, if it's, if it's one minute, uh, let's say it's two minutes before the top of the hour, I will wind this around to where it says, you know, whatever the hour is plus 59 minutes, let it run. And then as soon as I hear the chime, I'll stop it. And then I'll restart it right when my reference time says it's exactly the top of the hour. And that's one way that I like to, you know, figure out how accurate it is. And then again, I, I might fiddle with the position of the weight to get it more, even more accurate than that. Now this is an eight day movement. So most people, when they have a clock with an eight day movement, they wind it once a week. So every seven days, that gives you a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit extra time if you're a little bit late <laughs> on that. But uh, so once a week is a good, about a good uh, time to, to wind it up. And it takes about eight, eight and a half winds with this key to wind it up. Now, the funny thing is, you know, I've, I've talked about how you want to try as, as hard as you can to, to regulate and get it exactly right. But the only way to wind it up is to stop it. <laughs> so <laughs> perhaps you want to make it run, oh, uh, 15, 20, maybe 30 seconds fast every week so that when you stop it in order to wind it, then it'll be right on again. So, uh, but the, since the, the winding key goes right here uh, at the six o'clock position and actually goes through the space where the pendulum would be moving, you have to move the pendulum to one side or the other and then get this across all the way to, uh, you know, that, that part on the barrel where you're actually winding the thing. So again, you know, just just gently about, uh, you know, eight winds or so per week, and that keeps it going. The amount of resistance you get with the winding key when you wind it up is pretty consistent until right at the end, all of a sudden, it's just it just stops letting you wind it anymore. So, you know, <laughs> you can you can be pretty gentle and then uh, just as soon as it gives you that resistance, just stop and you're good to go for a week or eight days. The only other really negative thing about this, I could say, is that, of course, because it's all open it, it, and if you've got a problem with dust around, you know, it's going to attract dust and, uh, you know, you got to be very careful about how you clean that dust away. But apart from that, I, you know, I, I think you'll do pretty well over time. So what's the bottom line? Well, I saw this for sale uh, some different places online, but uh, mostly through Amazon. And it was somewhere between about $130 and $150, somewhere in there is a pretty typical price. You may spend more depending on, you know, some of the more high-end retailers. It's the same thing. You might cost more, but I I'd say you could get this for under $150. And uh, it's just a nice conversation piece. And uh, again, something that will require your attention but um, it, it's kind of nice to have a clock that requires your attention. You can fiddle with, with it for a little bit. And, and again, admire just the great craftsmanship and engineering in there with, uh, with all these exposed mechanical pieces that you can watch as they go. And so, um, you know, maybe someday I'll get the wall version. And if I do, I'll make another video. But in the meantime, thanks for watching this one. And I hope you will join me in the future for more episodes of 
The Good Timekeeping Show.